and give you some insight on what you need to be doing. So by the time you graduate, you'll already have a button down plan to figure out what's next, as opposed to uh, shaking Dr. Hess's hand, uh, graduation afternoon, and then saying, well, what's next? What do I do now? Uh, and I've got the perf perfect person uh, that can help us in this area, and not just relative to, to, to sports. Uh, he's, he's been um, in a variety of areas, all walks of life. Uh, so I value his insight. You know, there's a famous quote, you become like the five people you spend uh, most of your time with. And while I haven't had significant time with Mark, I've had enough, uh, probably more than he would have liked, because I always hold on to his coattail. And I told him that as, as soon as I met him, that's what I plan to do. Uh, I don't want anybody else's opinion when it comes to, you know, uh, what it looks like to live in the world of media. I can, I can call an expert and he has the answer and it's always spot on. Um, so I want to give you a little bit more about uh, Mark's background. Spent 15 years uh, at ESPN, starting ESPN the magazine, moved on to ESPN events, and that was the area in which I met him in. Um, he rounded out his career with working for ESPN's The Undefeated, uh, where he wrote uh, about soccer, culture, and historically black colleges and university. That's, that is the, the short version of his bio. Uh, we could be here for hours if I gave you every single pillar, and I don't want to do that. So I want to hand it over to Mark Wright. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you joining us, and uh, welcome to Railway, and welcome to Lincoln Memorial University, Mark. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely no pressure on Mark Wright to say all the right things today. Um, there's pressure. Uh, believe me, there's pressure. Guys, it's my privilege and honor to sit before you um, and to get to know you guys a little bit. Um, thank you for coming out in droves. I mean, there's, there are no empty boxes on my, on my screen. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And um, I don't know about the other speakers or other Zoom calls you've been on, but I am going to try really hard to do um, more listening today um, versus talking. Um, he got the short bio because long bios are exaggerated and uh, half of them aren't really true. So whatever you've gotten there, and if it's, sh if it's short, then I'm with it. That's what it's about. So thanks again for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And, and um, by all means, everything is, this is a safe, safe space, safe place. Ask me anything uh, relative to my career. Um, if you want to talk about mistakes and missteps, we can go there as well. That will be longer than the bio. Uh, so feel free to, I'm an open book. So thank you again. And uh, that's my open, brother. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, there's a chat se a session that is on the side. And Luke, uh, Preston, I will rely on you guys to uh, facilitate that, to lead and point us in the direction of questions. Um, while we're getting to that point, Mark, I'll always I'll ask the first question. I, <laughs> I don't mind, um, because I know this is exactly what everybody is thinking right now. Um, how in the world? Did you make a transition uh, from, you know, Howard University, a well-known HBCU? And by the way, if you if you like college football and you've never been to, uh, and you like homecomings, if you've never been to Howard's, then you're doing it wrong. You're, you're missing out. So let me throw that out there. But talk about Howard University as a bachelor's so is where you obtain your bachelor's and to uh, the worldwide leader in ESPN. How did that work for you? How was that transition? What were your steps? Sure. So uh, first off, I'll just say I was I was very lucky, right? Um, and um, you will find out here from today's call that that I'm not shy, and I wasn't shy as a as as a college student. Um, I just threw myself into conversations. Um, probably half of them I shouldn't be in the room, but I, I I didn't care. I did. I believe it was nine internships at Howard while I was at Howard. And only one is required. Every summer, wherever there was an internship, um, I found myself uh, in that room, putting my hand up, and somebody felt sorry for me. I just kept volunteering. I didn't. I didn't want to take a summer job. I wanted to do an internship into my field of work. And the very first internship that I did was at the Oakland Tribune in Oakland, California. I'd never been to California. Uh, never been to Oakland. 
Um, and I raised my hand and I got that reporter's uh, internship there um, doing like, you know, on the ground beat reporting, um, community um, stories, mom and pop stores type of uh, pieces. And um, my journalism professor at the time, uh, Larry Kagwa, uh, is this little short Nigerian man, uh, had a squeaky voice. And he always he called all his students son and daughter. He said, son, I'm going to make you a reporter this summer. And he, he was just such an inspiration to me. Um, again, so that was date myself now. That was, uh, well, yeah, we did have cell phones, but they were really, really big. Like, I needed a separate bag for it. And, um, but we were on the ground uh, doing stories, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with, with storytelling. And then one internship just led to another led to another and led to another. That's kind of how it worked. Um, and uh, my first job out of school was uh, Howard University's in Washington, DC. It was at the Washington Times on the copy desk. So, you know, the job there was to basically get to work around seven and uh, all the reporters who were on the ground writing stories, uh, game stories. Once they're done around 1030, they send them to you and you have to make sure that uh, they're good enough to print. There was no, you know, you didn't get a byline. Um, you, you only got your name called when you made a mistake. And that was scary because I made a lot of mistakes. Copy editors do. And uh, that job led me to New York at Black Enterprise and then eventually to, to ESPN, uh, the magazine, which was to this date, to this point, the best job um, I've ever had in my career. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, you know, one thing I, in my experiences and, you know, previously working in, in sports information, I've had students to come to me and say, hey, I want to get in front of the camera. I want to interview a coach. I want to interview a player and I want to do this feature. I want to start my own show. And they've got all these bright ideas, Mark, and, but they can't write. Not saying that they're not capable, they just haven't learned yet. Can you explain to this group the importance of writing? And that's whether you're in front of a camera, on the side of it, turning it on, carrying it. Tell them the importance of writing. Well, look, you just described Mark Wright. I fancied myself, you know, the next uh, Stuart Scott. Rest in peace, Stuart Scott. Uh, I, I saw myself get getting to, to work around 9.30 at night and doing the 11 o'clock, you know, highlights and having my own show and, and all of that. And, and uh, but those internships didn't, didn't pay. I'll just tell you why I didn't go toward down that, down that path. Those internships, and I did like four of those, they just never paid. And I said, I'm trying to get paid this summer. My parents are going to let me get a job at a local convenience store, and I don't want to do that. So the print internships paid. 350 a week, 375 a week, I remember. So I just, I ended up being on that track. Um, but what's been consistent throughout is the ability to write and tell stories. I'll tell you right now, if you, everybody here who can hear my voice, if you can't communicate with the written word um, and you're trying to be in the field of communications and the field of storytelling, go do something else. Go do something else. If that's the only thing you get from me today and it feels a little harsh, I apologize. But I see it now uh, as a grizzly veteran in the game. I get emails from uh, students and I get emails from even people who have been in their fields of work for a long time and they can't communicate the written word. They can't get their points across. Um, and, but here, there, there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel, though, right? So before you, you uh, say, man, I'm in the wrong field, uh, Mark Wright just told me I'm no good. Before you go away and change your mind, uh, just know that there's a lot of people in our field who can't write. So there's an opportunity for you to be good at it, even, even now. Um, right now, I'm, I am freelancing and writing for a bunch of different outlets. I, I'm calling myself a hired gun. I'm just like writing stories, especially now that there's no sports. And so, but there's still sports stories. You know, game stories to write about, but there's still stories that need to be told. And so I'm raising my hand and all these different outlets are saying, okay, great, Mark, you know the game and so on. Let's, I'll, we'll give you assignments. And what I'm doing is I am challenging myself to get better. 
at storytelling um, and hate reading my stories after they've been published because I, I'm, I'm looking at them and saying, ah, if I had had one more, one more source in there, if I had one more um, point of view in there, maybe the story would have been a, a B plus instead of a B minus. Even at this point in my career, I am doing that. So I challenge you to, to, you, to the original question, um, challenge yourself to be uh, good writers and really to simplify it. It's just telling a story. Beginning, middle, end. And it's not up to you to um, decide how the reader concludes. It's up to him or her to make that conclusion, right? But as long as you do your job, you bring all the, you bring all the details, you bring all the points of views in there, then you've done your job. So the importance of writing and telling stories, and I'll, you, know, you guys, uh, you probably have my, my contact information. I'll encourage, please pass that on. Um, and I'll encourage you to reach out to me via email, hit me on social. But if you hit me on email, please know that I'm gonna be watching every single word. And if, if, if you make me think about something that I wasn't thinking about, I'll ask you about, you know, and I'll follow up by the way, with every single email that I get, I promise you that. Um, tell me something and tell me something about yourself that you wanna do, what your passions are, um, that will make me remember you. Because I'm telling this to a lot of people, not that I'm a speaker for hire, but I'm telling this to a lot of people who come to me and say, hey, um, I'm thinking of going in this, uh, towards this path, do you know anybody? And I'll happily pass your name and information on to people. But if your writing does nothing for me, I might forget. Very good. And, and he is absolutely right about, you know, again, if, if, if you're struggling with writing or you can't write, you may want to find something else to do. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, there was a story that um, I found to be compelling at uh, Tuskegee University and uh, passed it along to Mark. And after he got a hold of it, that's how I knew I needed to do something else. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm your athletic director, to be quite honest. I want to throw that out there. All right, I'm going to open it up for questions now. We've had plenty of time and I don't want to hog this. This is not for me, guys. Need you to ask them questions, or I'm going to start calling people out. Well, I'm seeing I'm seeing names on the squares here. So what I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to call some people out if you don't mind. And before uh, you answer a question, and I'm going to go with and forgive me if I pronounce your name if I mispronounce your name, but I'm going to go with Devin Carter first. Is that did I get that right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So yes, before you before you answer uh, the question. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, uh, and Josh, you can run clock 20, 25 seconds. Give me your name, your major, and one interesting fun fact. And let me give you some parameters real quick. An interesting fun fact is not, I'm on the football team. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's not interesting. That that's a fact, but it's not, it's not interesting. So no pressure. So you others think about it when I come at you and then you can, you can hit me with your question. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair Let's enough. Go. Let's go. My name's Devin Carter. Um, I, w I was a political science major, um, graduated from Elon University. Um, I'm now the women's basketball coach here at Lincoln Memorial. Um, fun fact about me, I was on the debate team at Elon. And um, I also, if I had to choose another profession, I would be a pro bass fisherman. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> See, that, see that's an inter those are two interesting fun facts. I love it. I love it. All right, now I'm on the hot seat, so hit me with your question if you have one. So, um, like I said, I, I was a political science major, so obviously current events and the climate we're in right now in society is uh, very interesting to me. Um, political debates and, and elections are uh, interesting to me. Have you ever had to write a story? Um, where you were morally like, not necessarily morally or, or just kind of conflicted. Um, and, and it was an article that was just really tough for you to write. Like, have you ever found yourself conflicted uh, with your writing? Uh, great question. Um, the answer to that is, is yes. I'll even say conflicted and just downright scared. And, I'll, and I remember the example. I don't even have to think hard. Um, after, so I left ESPN's The Undefeated. I'm proud to say I was one of the founding editors 
uh, there. I left ESPN The Undefeated because um, another opportunity came my way and, and I thought it'd be a challenging opportunity. And it was working for a media company out of uh, uh, California, Mountain View, called Ozzy Media, O-Z-Y. And my very first, so my role there was to be the senior editor for sports and race, two verticals that are right there in my wheelhouse. And one of the first pieces, and I'll just say this, the editors there, uh, their journalistic journalism standards are extremely high. Uh, every story needs to have three sources. Um, and, you know, it, it gets run through the ringer. You know, a few editors get to look at your work. So when you hand in your work and by the time it comes out, the only thing you might recognize is your name. Uh, and so the very first piece that uh, I wrote was literally Greek to me. And that, not only is that is not just a joke because I was I, – the, the prime minister of Greece had just been appointed. And we have this round robin thing there where uh, editors get an opportunity to write and your name comes up. And whatever the news of the day is, right? Whether it's sports and race, Mark, right? Which is your wheelhouse. But if it's politics or if it's whatever, your name's up. So I got the opportunity. My name came up. I just the first assignment that I did. So it's my first opportunity to make an impression, right? Uh, beyond the, the bio uh, was to prove my work, was to write a profile on the new prime minister of Greece. And I had no sources in Greece. I didn't know who the man was. I didn't know anything about his policy. Zero. But when I tell you I was starting at zero, um, and obviously I'm on the deadline. And it was stressful. Um, and I'm thinking about this on my way to soccer practice with my son. And, you know, palms are sweaty. Now, the, the end of the story is I got it done. Um, but, the, but there was a lot of anxiety there. There was a lot of, uh, you know, should I even have taken this job? Is this how it's going to go? Uh, I like being challenged, but I like a warning as well. Um, so that was, that was just one of the examples um, that I remember. And then another one, uh, which wasn't quite as scary, was when I was put in a position to be a producer on a documentary. Um, I didn't go to school for film, film production, right? Uh, I got my BS in, in journalism, primarily as a, as a writer. So this was, again, a wheelhouse that uh, was, wasn't comfortable for me. And the director of the documentary said, Mark, you know, we like you, you tell good stories, you're a good journalist. We're gonna give you the role of producer here. Okay, I'm Googling what does a producer do on a documentary. Of course, I took it, uh, but this, those are just two examples. But I will say this, um, I, I, I met the challenge, right? Um, it was scary, but I got through it and to the point where I can act, actually sit in front of a group of people and talk about it without getting uh, too anxious about it. So I lived. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to point somebody else. Guys, get ready. You know what the homework assignment is. How about Mr. Randy Rivera? I see you smiling, Randy, but we can't hear you. Unmute. Randy, can you hear us? We can't, we can't hear you. Okay. There he is. Uh, all right. Well, that's one way to get out of the assignment, right? Say your microphone's broken. All right. Well, while you fix that, Randy, I'm going to go with Matt Gentry next. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Matt. Uh, what was the the criteria? What did I have to say? Okay, all right. So uh, your name, your major, and an interesting fun fact. And you already know what, what's not an interesting fact, right? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Uh, my name is uh, Matthew. Question. Yep. My name is Matthew Gentry. Uh, my major is business. I'm undecided in what field in business as of currently. 
Um, and then fun fact, I, for like three years of my life, I used to be part of a hot air ballooning team. Yeah, that, that qualifies. That qualifies. Yeah. All right, your question. Um, what's the best way to report on a topic um, and be unbiased that you've found? Uh, good question. Um, because with every story that you write, every story you work on, um, we're all human beings, right? So your biases are going to ring, are going to come through, right? Um, so that's probably the hardest thing uh, to do as storytellers, as, as journalists, is to um, remove yourself from the story, right? Don't make yourself part of the story. As a matter of fact, um, I'll tell you about a quick pet peeve. Any story that you see where the correspondent is right there next to the subject, that just grates at me. I mean, it, you know, you got the reporter playing hoops with the ball player, um, you know, just, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with that kind of B-roll and hanging out and doing all that, but you're not part of the story. Get, 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 get out of that. Um, yeah. We don't need that. Um, so that, that bias is coming out, but it's really hard. And I think it's important for you to, when you're telling a story, you need to actually get sources and have the sources be the voices of your story um, and just set them up, right? And set them up with, with, uh, with, with you know, the graphs in between and let their voices ring clear. Um, and if, if you, while during the reporting process, if you, if you hear yourself, if you hear yourself in the stories uh, ringing loud and clear, then you know you can dig a little deeper. Maybe you need some more voices. Maybe you need to actually go back through your interview, right? And look at what your sources gave you and put a little bit more of them into it and, 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 and less of you, which is hard. I'm not saying that's easy. Um, you know, I have a certain writing style and one of the greatest compliment I've ever been paid is uh, someone telling me, I know a Mark Wright story when I hear it. And that's the greatest compliment that I've ever been given. But, you know, at, at the same time, um, you know, when the story calls for it, Sometimes we need a little less of Matt Gentry, a little less of Mark Wright in it. Just, just report the facts, uh, tell the story, and then your job is to leave it up to the reader and to, the, to, to uh, interpret, um, you know, the information that you just left up. Thank you. Kind of vague, I'm sorry, but, but uh, you know, that, that, that's a tough one. All right, so uh, we're going to go with, all right, the hot seat for everybody. Let's go with, how's Elena doing? Did I get that right? Elena Daniels. Go again? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Elena. Um, I actually go to Tuskegee University. Um, I'm a physical education major. Um, and my question is, What's your interesting fun fact? Oh, my fun fact. Um, I have a, a media business myself that I've been trying to grow. It's called Establish the Lead. Okay. Um, my question for you is, do you have any, like, what, what's your ultimate goal? Like, what can you, what do you want to accomplish and say, like, I've made it? Like, what is your ultimate goal as far as sports media? What do I want to be when I grow up? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think it's just in recent years that I've kind of even thought about that. That that's, that's almost like the, what's the legacy you want to leave behind, right? What do you want people to say, um, about you when that time comes, right? Well, Mark Wright accomplished this and, it's very simple. I promise you, I will not make this long-winded. It's very simple for me. I think I'm at, at, I'm at a point in my career where I only want to tell stories about people falling down, getting back up, and redeeming, re redeeming themselves. Those are the only stories I care about um, where we can all read the story and be inspired. We can all read the story and take a life lesson from it to help ourselves, right? I have no interest. I have no interest in being 
the beat reporter for the Lakers, even with LeBron, unless LeBron called me himself. That would be a different story. Uh, but I have no interest in traveling, uh, uh, being a traveling journalist, covering a sports team uh, at this point in my career. Because for me, um, while those things are important, I don't want to uh, belittle that. That's just not where I see myself. So, and I got this way because, and here comes the shameless plug, I got this way because four years ago, I got to tell the story of Howard University, my alma mater, um, being the first historically black college um, to win a national division one national championship in soccer in 1974. And the reason that story means so much to me, it's first off, it's my alma mater. And second of all, um, the star player on that team was my high school soccer coach. You had some, at some point, your boy has some skills. Um, and, and so that story just meant so much to me and means so much to me even today because I was the producer. That's where I learned how to be a producer. I was the producer. I was the writer. I was the garbage man as well. I did everything. And I wanted to make sure that that story, which had never been told, I wanted to make sure that when that film hit the ESPN Films airways, that all the people who were influencers, right, would say, wow, we need to give the likes of Mark Wright more opportunity to tell stories like that. And HBCU stories, there's a, there's a million of them that haven't been told. And I just kind of hope that Redemption Song, which is the name of the, the film, um, sort of created a pathway for other stories like that to be told. And I think that that was so gratifying for me, I just said, these are the only stories I want to tell. So that's what I want people to say, you know, when the time comes for somebody to start talking about me. But you know, we're, we're, we're a long way from that. I'm not burying myself yet. <laughs> we got more questions, are we, we entertained? Is this going okay? Absolutely, it is. Good, good, good. I like I, I like you calling people out. Continue to sing. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, uh, Miss Bailey. Uh, Hi. Hey. How are you? Uh, I'm good. How are you? Excellent, um, excellent. My name is Bailey Patton. I'm an accounting major, and a fun fact about me is that both of my thumbs are double jointed. What? Yeah, you want to see? It's kind of cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Can That's you hold them both up and do that? Yeah, I can. Hold on. Let's see. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There you go. There yeah. You go. Yep. Yep. I think I think I think you just won the day, by the way. Not that I was keeping score, but I think you just you just did that. Well, I'm <laughs> glad I could. Glad I can contribute in that way. That's um, right. That's so right. My question, uh, what's your favorite story you've ever done? Um I think, I think that's a tough one. Um, I think the Howard story that I just talked about was probably um, the most impactful story I've ever done um, because it reached so many people around the world. Um, so it's got to be up there. I think as a Howard alum, I'm contractually obligated to mention that one at the top. Um, but they... They've, they've been others. Um, another one that comes to mind is um, I wrote a story about uh, a young um, soccer player who played, uh, plays for DC United still. He was 22 years old. I was actually on another assignment, um, just doing another story. It was in Washington, DC. And um, it was a DC United sponsored event for, you know, and I saw him like on the sidelines playing with some kids. And I um, I went up to him and, and spoke with him and, and I just, hey, tell me your story. And we had some people in common and I left it at that. Nine months later, I saw in his feed that he was in the hospital because he had um, cancer. And when I met him that day, he was telling me, yeah, I'm on injured reserve right now. Just having some tests, not really sure what's going on. But the guy looked completely healthy. He, he looked fit. Um, but he just said, I'm just, I'm just getting really tired. And, and we stayed in touch. And I saw that, you know, that came up in his feed that he was going through it. And I reached back out to him 
and nobody had told his, he hadn't really told his story. There was the news story um, that he was out, but nobody really told the backstory and then his family story. Uh, and then I, I had an opportunity to do that. And um, it was really important for him that his, his whole story uh, had been told. And the best feeling in the world is when you tell the story about somebody and they call you and they say, I have never had my story told like that before. Thank you. I sent my story to my grandma and she said, wow, I didn't even know that about you. Like those are the things, right? And it's those little small details. Um, don't overlook any of the small details, right? If the guy is, is pigeon toed, write it at the risk of offending him, right? Um, just those little those little nuggets and those are the things that, and by the way, most people don't do this. So you can still create a niche for yourself, right? People just overlook the details, the small details, um, but they're so important to, 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 to the broader stories that you're telling. So, I, so there's been a few of those and I, I'm happy to send that link to you because I think that story is really important. And, and then selfishly what it did for me was um, people started to see that, okay, so if you really want your story to be told, you really want somebody to put you on, you need to contact this Mark Wright guy. And I'm not saying I've gotten, you know, a thousand offers since, but I've, I've been contacted by a few people, right? And I'm talking about marketing and PR people who have athlete clients, right? Who want their athletes to be presented in a certain light. So um, people are always listening. They're always watching. Um, so, you know, try your best at whatever you do, right? however long or however short, just try to make it your best. I know that sounds kind of cliche and jargony, but just try your best to make it the, uh, the best piece that you do to that point. You know, it's like uh, the great Allen Iverson who had a birthday, I believe this week, he made it cliche to say, I play every game like it's my last. And it sounds cliche. You've probably heard a lot of athletes say that. But if you know anything about that guy, he really did play every game like it's his last. Uh, and he got so much out of his, you know, five foot 10, 165 pound body. And uh, truth be told, Alan Iverson is one of my favorite athletes of all time. Good answer? Okay, all right. We got, we got time for more, sir? We absolutely do. And, and I'm gonna call out an individual here, Mark, um, Micah does a lot for the athletic department. So if you ever scroll around, and I know you do your research, you, you, you probably um, did your investigating on our social media handles and our website. And if you've seen any of those hype videos, he's, he's been the brains behind that. And he's actually an undergrad. So I'm not sure what Micah's major is, but he's, he's definitely influential in our department. So I'm going to force him to ask a question, Micah. Sure. Uh, so I'm currently an exercise science major right now, but in the past two years, uh, LMU recently reached out to me and was seeing a lot of my video work uh, with cinematography, and eventually they just plugged me in, and I've been busy ever since. Uh, but a question I do have... Was that your interesting in, fun fact, Micah? Because like, it's pretty uh, Actually, I have run an ultra marathon before. So that was definitely an experience to look back on. Okay. Um, I like it. Yeah. Right. But the question I have is, I guess with social media now, I believe people's attention span is getting a lot shorter. So one of my biggest troubles has always been keeping it short with the story. Um, and I wonder if you've ever had any problems with that regards to story uh thank you micah and, and yeah that's a thing right um get to the point short enough with the long anecdotal leads and all that stuff um and that kind of saddens me but that's kind of how it is and i think um but i put less emphasis emphasis on keeping it short and i challenge myself to make it interesting right um the first idea that you have for your intro paragraph is probably not your best one, right? Uh, you probably need to write down five or six and then maybe run them by, you know, a friend uh, and say, look, which one of these hits you? 
or maybe you can just look at them and find out. Um, so yeah, it, especially with video, um, you know, uh, there's, there's that need to make it, uh, to get straight to the point. Um, but you know what, Micah, I would encourage you, uh, obviously if, if you got to understand the parameters of the story you're telling, you got to understand the parameters of the, of the feature video that you're putting together. Obviously if it, if it's supposed to be three minutes long, make it three minutes or less, don't make it 10. Um, if you're, if your word count, uh, for a particular assignment, it's 750 words. Give them that, right? Don't make it 1,500. You won't be called back. Um, but just know that, um, you know, challenge yourself to make it interesting and to make it, to make it powerful where you want to move people. You know, another boring thing about me is when I sit down and do interviews with people, um, my goal, whatever the story is, is to make you cry. Like I am going to, I am going to go there. And I'm going to find a weak spot, uh, and I'm going to, um, you know, if I know that a subject, if I if I know that a subject that I'm talking to um, had a really really good relationship with his dad, and it's a Father's Day piece, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to talk about, you know, tell me about the last day, the very last day. Yeah. You saw your dad. Tell me about the last conversation. And if, and if I sense that I'm pushing and I'm pushing and it's not and nothing's happening, I'm not gonna stop until the person says, "All right, man, I see what you're doing. Stop." And that's okay, right? But you gotta get some emotion out of people. You gotta get some emotion out of people uh, to absolutely do your best work. So just remember that. Make them cry. Maybe you'll be known as the person who, here she comes. She's about to make me cry. I think that's okay. It's part of the storytelling. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Good luck to you. Thank you. You can call anybody else out? Uh, no, while we're thinking of others, we, we can. Uh, but I, I don't want this to lose sight. This is a personal question for me, Mark. Uh, the, the NFL draft was, uh, I mean, this past spring was different from anything we've ever seen in the past <laughs> uh, on the worldwide leader. And after the fact, a couple of things stood out. And I, it was just in my observations with, uh, via social media um, that a lot of the lower third graphics gave facts about some of the draftees. And some of them weren't so good. Yeah. Um, again, as, as you mentioned, as a reporter, it is, it is your job to, to be informative. Some of these things, a little judgmental. You may you, you may look at it and think hmm, they probably could have held that one out. For example, I think one of the one of the draft choices had um, a mother that had a drug addiction, and instead of putting certain other facts about this player, that was one of the things that went up. Tell me about that fine line and, and your thoughts on that in terms of being informative in, in certain areas. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I can't remember if you and I talked about this when it happened in real time, but um, so it, it's it's one of those things where and, and you're hearing a lot about diversity and inclusion um, in today's social climate, um, particularly with the news of the day and everything that we're all consumed with right now, um, and I've had the privilege in the last week or so to be, you know, among a group of, you know, African-American journalists who are getting called right now. Hey, be on our podcast, talk about soccer and racism. Hey, be on our, um, you know, we're gonna, we need a source for this. So suddenly I'm an expert, which I'm not, um, but I'm an expert. And, and I'll bring it back to uh, diversity and inclusion. When you have that in the room, um, and when you have a diverse group of eyeballs and perspectives looking at something like that, details on um, athletes that come up on the lower thirds, um, you need to have people in the room who can say, yeah, that's an interesting fact, sure, but this might not be the place for it, especially if you can't bring context to it, right? So um, to your point about, you know, that athlete's mom, um, it's assuming it's true, right? But is that the place for it? 
Um, and are you treating all the other athletes who aren't of color the same way? And um, when you have diversity in the room, you have a bunch of people who can look at something and say, yeah, no, I don't think so. No, I, the tone here is not right. Um, and then people feel empowered to speak up. So it's one thing to, to have diversity and inclusion, but do, you, do people feel uh, comfortable enough to actually raise their hand to say, no, this isn't, this isn't where, this, I don't think this is good. I'm actually offended by this, or I can see where this will be taken the wrong way. I'll tell you, I told you ESPN, the magazine, was my best job ever, ever. Um, and I remember um, the editor-in-chief of uh, the magazine at the time, uh, John Papanek. Uh, everybody called him Max, which is the name of my oldest. And I remember a writer writing a story. I forget what the story was. And uh, there was some vernacular in the story. Um, it sounded maybe some hip hop vernacular in the story. And the, the, white, the writer was, was not African-American. I believe he was white. And he was using the word, he was using the word dog and D-O-G uh, and then D-A-W-G as my dog, right? And, but they were, they were mixing, they were using it in, in the wrong context, right? So if it's my dog, it's D-A-W-G and it's D-O, you, you, you guys know where I'm going. And for me, it was a no brainer. I saw that and I'm like, I know that he's not talking about his pet. Um, and I remember, um, the editor actually not coming at me, right. And challenging me, but he pressed me and, um, because the magazine didn't have a lot of that jargon in it, right. It wasn't a source sports, uh, Google the source sports kids. Um, but at the end of the day, he said to me, Mark, you're right. So there was diversity in the room, right. But I also felt empowered as a young journalist, right, to actually, first off, talk to the editor-in-chief, right, actually go to his office and talk to him. But he listened to me. Um, and that, to bring it back to uh, the draft, that's what wasn't happening during that time. And it's live TV, and it's lots of things going on, but these things get vetted, you know, weeks before. That was a mistake, and that was an embarrassment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Sure. Still want to leave this floor open for questions for some of our student athletes, coaches, staffers you're on to. Don't feel left out. Mr. Wright, I got a question for you. And I, I know there's a um, I know a lot of writers take pride in their work and being transparent and everything else like that. Um, and then when you watch the news sometime, obviously different stations are, I guess, you know, trying to, I guess, push their agenda through. Um, kind of going with my first question, I'm going to give you a scenario. Fox News comes to you and say, okay, um, we want you to work for us. Um, would that be a move that you would make? And if you did, is that a move where you can – actually speak your truth or would the does the company control that narrative in those situations like if they're asking you to write for their outlet mm -hmm. um so um so anybody great question anybody can reach out to anybody right and say you know we think you can help us and we can help you um but i think and and I think you're better positioned to make that decision, make a thoughtful decision when, when you become a grown up, right? When you actually can think about um, what will this do for my career? What will, you know, does this company, um, company's morals align with my own values, right? Um, is, this, is this where I want Mark Wright's name to be? Do I want this to be part of, um, you know, when people talk about Mark, here I am burying myself again, but when it's all said and done, is this what I want people to say? And that's a tough one to make because, um, you know, my wife, and I, my wife's also a journalist. She's the, she's the smarter of the two here, no question about it. And we always talk about um, whenever we're faced with a decision like that, we always say to ourselves, okay, 
how is this going to affect the family? How is this going to affect the kids? How is this, does this mean, so does this mean that, you know, you are no longer going to be here during the week? You're only going to be here on the weekends. Uh, does this mean that you're now going to be writing on a subject matter that you have no expertise in, but you look the part? Do you, is, is this where we're going? Is that what we're doing right now? Um, and, you know, we actually have a, a you know, we actually have a, a, a check the box system and say if it doesn't, and if, it, if it's going to affect the family in, in, a, in a negative sort of way, we say no. And we actually have said no. Um, but when you're young, and you're hungry and you're looking for a way to, to make a name for yourself, make some more money for yourself. I've had lots of friends in the industry who have gone to the dark side, if you will, um, in the hopes of, you know what, I'm just gonna grind here for three years, build up my platform and get out when I can, when I can get out. But it's never that easy because it's, it's, it's easy to get in. It's never, that easy, never easy to get out because lots of different forces keep you in, you know, if that makes sense. Uh, I have a couple questions, actually. And this is Nolan? Nolan, yeah. All right, don't forget the game, Nolan. All right, so uh, uh, my name is Nolan Hughes. I'm a sport management major. I'm on the bowling team. And my fun fact would be that I have a, I run my own blog at cantlosehughes.com, and I write about bowling, the NFL, NBA, all that kind of stuff. like it. So I have two questions, actually. The, the first one would be, how do you choose your path um, based on like your passion versus what you're like an open path. So for me, I like the NFL and the NBA more, but those fields are oversaturated and super hard to break into yeah. while the bowling media field is wide open and I could pretty much walk into it like tomorrow if I wanted to, yeah. but it's slightly less like interesting to me. Yeah. So how do you balance between, between that? So let me just tell you, Nolan, uh, go to, uh, go to the door where it doesn't have a line. Okay. Uh, go straight to the, just go straight to the opportunity in this, in this regard, uh, bowling. First off, you're, you're a subject matter expert. You bowl, you know, the game, you know, the nuances. Um, so you're a subject matter expert. When I, when I need somebody to talk to, I'm coming to you, right? Um, I was faced with the same issue coming out of school. Soccer is my love. We're a soccer family. Uh, my son plays at American University. He's a freshman. And my freshman and high school son um, is also a, a player. At some point, I was the best soccer player in the house. That ended a long time ago. But soccer was the beat that I wanted to cover. Like, that's, that's where I wanted to be. Um, but those opportunities didn't come my way. Um, and so I ended up being a copy editor. And I ended up going that path for a few years and here's what it did for me. It made me um, a better editor. It made me a, a, a well-rounded journalist, right? And so when those opportunities came down the road for me to write about soccer, right? I was, I was much better prepared. So I know it's daunting, Nolan, um, that, you know, the thought of, you know, going down an, an avenue that, first off, the, the, you, you feel like maybe the national interest isn't there, the exposure isn't there. Um, uh, so was soccer, right? And, and look at the sport now, right? So maybe the time, maybe you will come back to basketball and to football and to other, any other the big four sports to make your name. But because you're a subject matter expert in bowling, um, because you have a blog, like you're halfway there already, um, I would encourage you strongly to go down that path that's right there in front of you. And it doesn't mean that you can't keep one eye uh, you know, on other sports as well, but I think you should concentrate at least for, for now, um, stay in the lane that, you, that you're in, stay in the lane that, you're, that you know, and if there's nothing else I say today, I'll, I'll strongly encourage you to go down that path. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's yeah. really helpful for me, actually, because I've gotten a lot of answers where it's, they don't really answer it and they kind of just 
yeah, you know, do whatever you want type of thing. But that, that actually really helps. Yeah, unfriend all those people, man. You need people to give it to you straight. <laughs> so my second question would be, um, how do you stay patient as you kind of work your way up? So, um, so like I'm, I run a blog, but obviously not too many people are reading at this point. I've had a couple where they got read by a few people. I actually wrote an article last year about the uh, number one bowler in the world, Jason Belmonte, and he actually read it. But nobody else reads it. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I've written a few, and my parents don't read it. So like, how do you, how do you kind of grind through it for eight, ten, twelve hours a day, wh however many, when there's no immediate or even potentially a future payout, whether it's financially or socially or anything like that. All right. First, all right. First thing, I want you to um, uh, send me that story about the the bowler. Or, or tweet that story out and I will retweet that story and I will plug it. And so after that happens, we'll have at least five more people read that story, all right? So, so do that, don't forget that. Um, how do you kind of grind and, and kind of stay with it? I mean, there's no secret sauce with that, right? Um, you, just, you just gotta do it. And I think, I think it's so cool, by the way, that you have, carved out this niche for yourself. Um, I don't want you to think of it as a, as a, uh, as a handicap, right? I mean, I think um, there's nobody else on this call today um, that does what you do. And I didn't even ask, I just know it. So I need you to think of yourself as, I said subject matter expert earlier, um, but I mean, I know 10, um, reporters who cover basketball and football and are friends of mine, right? Um, and soccer. Um, but I don't know too many who do what you do. You have a great opportunity. So, so grind, just grind. And actually, I think, uh, you know, you said you talked about, um, you know, the best player in the world who nobody knows. Um, those are the type of stories, by the way, um, that get eyeballs. And so I think you should challenge yourself and try to, to uh, find those subjects where people go, oh, I didn't know that, right? Um, and use that story there as sort of your, your, your exhibit A and say, you know what? Um, here are the types of stories I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after. Um, you know, the greatest, the greatest game nobody ever, nobody knows about, right? Stories that have never been told. Um, you're in an area where you can do that. So I think, and again, to do that, you gotta grind and, and you gotta stay up late, you gotta wake up early, all those cliche things, right? But I'm not worried about you because um, the line of people who are doing it isn't long. So you might, not have to, you might not have to stay up late. You might not have to wake up early. I'm encouraging you to do it, but I'm just saying, stay on this thing before it blows up because it's, it's gonna. Thank you, I appreciate that a lot, thank you. You're welcome. Can I call on somebody, Josh? Go right ahead, it's all you, Mark. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm looking at Miss Spikes. Hi. I don't know. Hi, hey. can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Tatiana Spikes and I'm an elementary education major and a fun fact about me would be that I play the violin. Um, and so my question for you would be, do you ever feel like, or have you ever felt like you've had to work 10 times harder or 20 times harder than your counterparts, even when your story was obviously better, but do you ever feel like you had to like overcome stuff like that? Uh, great question. The answer with, to that would be every day. Every day. Um, and I pause there because that's just the that's just the long and short. Um, by now, you know the best job I ever had was ESPN the magazine. I left because I felt like I was working twice as hard, and I wasn't seeing, uh, I wasn't getting credit for stories that I did or stories that I pitched, and the editors there were telling me I had to wait my turn and I had to get in line. And I used colorful language in my head and I said, 
no. And I left. And I remember um, my mentor at the time, uh, who was a, you know, big time higher up at the company at the time. I remember him telling me, hey, Mark Wright, I don't think you should leave. I think you should wait your turn because you're dynamic and good things are going to happen. But at the same time, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, don't go pursue your passion. Don't go pursue your dreams because um, you've already developed um, a name for yourself and people like you and respect you. And when the opportunity comes back, while you go out there and learn and you figure things out, um, there'll be an opportunity for you to come back to the company. And it's, I, you know, as my Jamaican parents would say, so said, so done. It was six years later, I got an opportunity to work uh, for ESPN events where I met Jasher and I was living and we were living in New Jersey at the time. And um, the opportunity was so uh, big for me at the time. It was like beyond anything that I ever even thought of. And that opportunity would not have come my way if I didn't leave. So um, the whole twice as hard thing um, I've, I've kind of, uh, you know, that, that follows me every day. And an, an interesting fun fact is, um, before, um, the undefeated was actually named the undefeated. Um, one of the names that they, they had on the table for the platform was twice as hard because as a platform geared for African-American athletes, right. And the African-American sports fan, um, uh, you know that you've been told coming up that you have to work twice as hard to get to the same destination as other people. Um, glad they didn't go with that name, uh, but uh, the undefeated was perfect. But that's a, again, a long answer to, to your question. Was that, was, was that good enough? Okay, good. I have some rules here for myself, and Josh has heard this whenever I speak to people, and it's uh, one, don't be corny, uh, don't be boring, don't make it about you. And when in doubt, uh, uh, talk about the kids. So I, I want to make sure that uh, I should have told you guys that on the front end. Um, hopefully, I, I'm, I haven't been, I'm not corny, maybe a little corny, definitely not boring. Well, you know, we both shopped at Marshall's and we saw each other in there one time. So not to throw that out there, Mark. That's a very interesting fun, and it's true, yes. Um, I want to mention something, and, and we we kind of hinted around the topic of race. And I listened to the podcast you were on, the, the Hat Trick podcast, uh, and it was the episode that was focused on the discussion of race in football, as in soccer, if you will. And uh, we have two soccer coaches on, by the way, men and women. Awesome. Uh, so, so this will be intriguing. But um, – the question was posed to you, and I thought your answer was brilliant, and I'd love for you to share it with the group. I'm going to share it on my social media page. The question was posed to you, um, and I'm paraphrasing, Mark. It was, what can white people do during, this, uh, during these difficult times? And um, your reply to that was, was brilliant. And if you don't mind, if you could, I don't know if you can retain the answer, but I'd love for you to answer that question for our group. Um, yes, uh, happy to. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing how things work in life. And, you know, I got that invitation to be on that podcast two hours before the actual airing or taping and recording. And um, this was just, last week, so we're not talking about, you know, a long time ago. And uh, we, we were all dealing with the news of the day. And as a, as a black father, um, it, with two young men, one who drives and one who's about to drive, uh, and one who's away at college, um, it, you know, it was a, it was a gut punch. And it still is a gut punch. And I, you'll, you'll hear me on the, on the podcast if you listen that I went for two days without knowing what to say to my sons. I went for two days not even talking to them. 
And as you guys have seen here over the past hour, actually speaking is not uh, my Achilles heel. Uh, I could put some words together, but I did not know what to say because I saw them hurting. Uh, but I had to deal with my own hurt. Um, anyway, I got through that. So I've, I've, I've been posed this question and I think, um, I think Joshua might, I don't think my answer has changed, but I, I think what I said on the podcast was that it is not enough to be appalled. Um, it is not enough to say, we see you, we hear you, uh, we don't see color, I want things to get back to normal. These are all things that you cannot say anymore. Um, and uh, I think I also said that, you know, to my many of my white friends who've called me and cried with me over the phone because they feel um, they've known me and Heather and the boys for 20 and 30 years and, and we just didn't know. We knew, but we didn't know. Um, we, we tell them, look, we love you. Um, we don't blame you. But since now you know, we now need you to be, to, to come ride with us, right? So when I'm in the room saying these things are happening, right? We need you to now say, yes, we see it and we know it. Um, because um, in the filmmaking world, they tell you if you're working, sadly, if you're working on a black story, right? If you're working on a black story and you want your story to actually um, resonate or to even be um, validated. You need to get some influential white voices in your story. And as disheartening and as sad that, as that is, that's really resonated with me today um, because there is, a, there is a, a, a sect in our society where if certain people aren't saying it, it's not legit, it's not valid, right? Obviously you know, black people have been pounding the pavement for years, right? This isn't a new thing that we're going through. But for some people, maybe some of our friends and family members, it's brand new. Uh, so I think it's incumbent on all of us, and particularly our, 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 our white brothers and sisters, to now be um, co-champions for us. I mean, to, to now be corner men and corner women while we're in there doing the fight for, for, for everybody to say, okay, He's right. Yes, I see something. I'm going to say something. Uh, and I think the time for, for everybody to be silent or the time for just some people to be vocal, them days are over. Those days are over. And so the, the topic of the day was, you know, racism in soccer. And um, I got fired up. I mean, I'll be honest. I got fired up. There were people on that podcast saying, you know, hey, as a former player, you know, when that happened to me back in the day, you know, I just, I just work twice as hard, Ms. Spikes. I work twice as hard. Uh, or I just put my head down and, and, uh, and, 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 and blocked out the noise. Nonsense. That might have been okay in 1985. But today, to expect a 19, 20, 22-year-old kid to now be the champion for social justice for his people, it's too much. That's too much pressure for one person. I think the responsibility starts way at the top. So I think my answer, Jasha, was, was probably something like that. That's exactly what it was. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions for Mark Wright? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, my name is Jayla Mays, and I'm an exercise science major and an incoming freshman. My fun fact is, I haven't had a soda in like seven years. Um, wow. And wow. my question for you is um, earlier you talked about how your ultimate goal is to make um, your readers cry. Well, further elaborating on that, like how would you describe your writing style? And like, is there something that influenced you or drew you to that style? Yes. Great question. Um, yeah. So my writing style is, is, is pretty easy. It's, it's, um, it's, First of all, initially, I wanna, I wanna bring you in with, um, I, I call it the eyebrow lift, right? So when you read my story, 
I want you to, I want that right eyebrow preferably to go up where you go, hmm, okay. And you make the decision to read the rest, right? You're like, oh man, that's, that's interesting. Never saw that coming. And so my writing style is to sort of take you on a, on a ride, not a crazy roller coaster ride, right? Just like an easy ride um, where, um, and, I'm, and I'm telling a story and weaving in little bits of facts in between um, to kind of keep you on the ride. I, I, like, I never want anybody to start my story. You know, when you click on a story, it says, hey, this is a five minute read. And you go, oh man, I don't have five minutes. Let me read the first two minutes and get back to it later. No, I want you to read my whole five minutes right there. I'm spoiled like that. And I challenge myself to take you on that ride where you, no, you never really want to get off. And I think I attribute that to my, my um, broadcast journalist, journalism background, um, where you have a three minute segment, right? That you're doing, a stand up. Nobody wants to walk away in the middle of that, right? You want to see it from, you want to see it all the way through. So I think that kind of um, uh, slow roller coaster, not crazy ride is my, is my writing style, storytelling style. Thank you. Thank you. This has been outstanding, Mark. And you know, initially I said that uh, this likely wouldn't go over an hour, but we're two minutes past fast forward, and it's it's going so well. I don't want to stop if we still got questions, guys. Uh, can you hear me now, Andy, my man? Welcome. Awesome. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> My name is Randy. Uh, I'm actually a media major myself. Um, I guess one interesting fact is uh, I have an extra two. Okay, yeah. 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 I also have opposable thumbs too, so I got a couple. Uh, <laughs> and I'm actually working on a short film for uh, next semester. Uh, I already written the screenplay I'm practically producing right now. Uh, Micah, actually, he's the cinematographer for it. So yeah, we got a couple projects going on. Um, my question is, as far as st storytelling goes, you know, I hear it all the time from fiction and in my media classes. It, sometimes it could be details, sometimes it's context, sometimes it's characters. What do, what do you think is the most important factor for writing? Details. 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 Yeah, man, details. Um, yeah, I think that's the most important, you know, like you should always be on a hunt for details and, and you should be like, uh, when the time comes to you to tell your story and this is it, you need to look down at the cutting room floor at all the details that didn't make it into the, into your project, into the film and go, ah, gosh, where am I going to find room for that? Right. And that's what, that's what, if you look down at the floor and there's nothing down there, that's not good, right? You, you actually didn't, yeah, there's more work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's always details to get, right? Um, I always tell myself, if I'm doing a profile on someone, um, I wanna make sure that the sources within the story can help me tell the story about Randy, right? So whether it's his uh, prom date, his mom, uh, his, his teacher, uh, a friend he's no longer friends with. I mean, all these people know you, right? and probably know more about you than you, you would rather them share, but that's all part of the, and again, maybe some of these details stay on the floor, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you at least want to have, I, so I think for me, that's the most Im Im important thing. And then you'll get the sources to actually help you tell the story. I mean, can you imagine how cool it was for me to interview my high school soccer coach um, 25 years after you know, he was my coach. So I'm sitting there and I'm interviewing him. First off, he's my hero, right? He was that guy. And I'm looking at him and I'm trying to make him cry. And I feel like I'm 16 though. And he's going to tell me, hey, go pick up the cones. You're not even worthy of interviewing me or talking to me. And that's how, that's how that was for me. But I am poking at him to give me information that he doesn't really want to share. Okay. And that's so why I always go back to that particular assignment. It was, it, was, um, it was so enlightening for me. And it was like, it was like boot camp. It was like journalism boot camp for me uh, in, in real time. Um, 
So yes, a plug for Redemption song. You guys gotta watch. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, I also have another question. Uh, I don't remember who the gentleman was earlier who had asked about agenda setting and uh, confirmation bias, all those kinds of things that we're actually dealing with in the uh, age of so much misinformation. Now, how do you keep up with, uh, how do you keep a fine line between telling a story and making sure that your facts are true and they're ethical? Yeah. Um, so, you know, soapbox time. I really do feel like, and, and, and Micah made the point earlier, uh, in the age of um, everybody wants to get the information first, everybody wants to be first, everybody wants to tell the story. Like we saw that, we saw that happen with um, sadly the, the, the Kobe, Kobe Bryant scenario where the accident happened and information was just trickling through, right? And even though they didn't have all the information, right? We didn't know who was on the helicopter, right? We didn't know who, you know, whether, you know, Kobe was with his whole family or one of his kids or two. We didn't know who. Um, uh, platform still blasted the information out and made us guess or made us absorb the story and not having all of it. And I would say, you know, uh, before social media became a thing, I think um, platforms and brands understood that, you know what, if we don't have all the information, or if we don't have close to all the information, maybe we should hold it until we do. Uh, and I think sadly, those days are, are, are kind of gone because, you know, many, many times now, you obviously you know about clickbait content. You read a headline and the headline's really good and it brings you in and you're reading and three graphs in, you're like, all right, this is really bad. Like there's, there's, there's nothing here um, that aligns with the really good headline that somebody wrote. So I, it's one of those things, I mean, look, social is not gonna go away. I'm not gonna sit here and say social media is a bad thing. I'm on all of them, right? Um, and they're, they're, they're important. And when I write a piece, um, you know, I use it to my advantage. Um, but I think this need for uh, this, this, this competition to be first um, it has, has upended uh, the importance of being right. And it's one of those things that uh, I don't know that it's going to change. I think maybe um, with what's going on in the world today, I think um, we've, all, uh, we've all been in a position where we all had to hit pause and sort of slow down and reassess everything that we do, reassess ourselves because we're all home, um, reassess what we do, take a, a hard look at, you know, am I as good as I think I am? Can I get better? Uh, and sort of challenge, in our, challenge ourselves. I know that's a broader point to the question, but I think that's happening. Uh, and hopefully brands will hold themselves accountable and maybe we'll see a sea change. Maybe, hopefully. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. I have a question. Yes. All right. My real name is Jackson Brantley. Uh, Backbone's just a nickname. Yes. Um, I'm a media communications major at LMU. And uh, whenever you got to talking about making your people cry or making the readers cry or, you know, um, something to that effect, it made me think about the 2014 Winter Olympics. Uh, Kristen Cooper, Bodie Miller, um, Kristen was interviewing Bodie about his, uh, uh, it was something to do with his brother. His brother had died previously and he started crying during the interview and sh the Kristen was later fired or released from NBC for that interview. Where do you think the line is drawn at for like the emotions you can like try to pull out of people for interviews or articles of things of that nature? Sure. Um, Oh, that's a, yeah, I didn't know that one. I think, um, you know, so your, your, your first job is to tell the story. And that's, that's your, that's your first job. I know I mentioned, Hey, I'm going to go in there and make you cry. If you cry while I, I accomplish the first task, then great. Um, I don't know that there is a line, um, that you should even have to worry about crossing. 
um, sometimes you do an interview and, um, or you try to tell a story and you get no emotion, right? Even no emotion is an emotion, right? Um, so, so again, you know, this is where you as the storyteller um, need to pull all that out, right? I mean, I had a, a, a couple of years ago, I wrote a piece on, um, you know, Steph Curry has a, has a um, entertainment uh, piece uh, company where he puts out films. And I think Steph's platform is he just, he, he just wants to tell, um, you know, good news stories and up, uh, stories of uplift. And that's his, that's his thing. And he did a documentary um, a couple of years ago, um, basically uh, taking us through, um, you know, the church shootings in, in Charleston. And I went to a screening at Howard University. They were showing the film and his, his mom was there, uh, his family was there, and I, and I got a chance to um, talk to his mom. And, and you, this one's gonna be easy. So it's mom, she's, it's, she's watching an emotional film, everybody's emotional, they were, they're wailing in the audience. Um, and her son's the executive producer. So there's already emotion without me even coming into, to, into play and asking the, the pointed questions. So I had mom right there anyway. Um, and I pulled her to the side and, uh, and started talking to her. And uh, she obviously got emotional. Um, she cried, she, she broke down, but she wasn't mumbling. She was talking and she was, I, I could understand what she's saying and she, she, she was verbose and she was articulate and all of that, all of that. And I wrote that story. And the feedback that I got from, I don't remember getting specific feedback from, from Steph, but the feedback that I got from his people uh, was that um, your first job was to talk about this film and what the film was about. So I did that. The fact that there was some emotion in there was a, just a backdrop to it. And they understood that and they recognized that because if, if, if I had led with the emotion, right, you know, maybe his mom would, wouldn't like that necessarily. I had, to, I had to make a decision on what's important here, right? What's the most important thing here? And I think, um, uh, and I don't make the right decision every single time, but I think in that moment, that was the right call to make. Um, remember why you're here, right? And then tell the story, and then whatever comes with that, comes with that. All right, it's thank a thin you. Line. It's a thin line for sure, but um, you know, I think it's important. You, you remember anything I say here, guys, I mean, look, um, at the top of every story, you're gonna have your name there, right? I mean, that's it, it's you. Um, and you gotta do work that you're proud of. But if you mess up, they don't know who to come to. They don't know who to find. And I've gotten that call um, from an editor. I've gotten that call from a source. And you gotta be ready to back that up. And sometimes the answer is gonna be, hey, I'm sorry, I got that one wrong. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, Mark. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up here. I, I think we've drained you enough. <laughs> answered every question thoroughly, so we're we're grateful for that. But uh, I will leave you with parting words before we disperse. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I think I appreciate you, Jasha, for uh, always taking my calls. Uh, that's first. That's the first thing. Um, and uh, I appreciate having you as uh, someone in the industry who I can text and call and just talk about things that uh, affect us in terms of uh, the space that we work in, but also as fellow um, African American men and fathers. And, and so we bond on that level as well. So I appreciate that. And I never take that, I never take that for granted. Um, so that's, that's the first piece. And for you, uh, wonderful young people, um, I need you to remember Mark Wright, because at some point, you know, um, I'll be looking for a job and you might be uh, looking for a nice uh, older gentleman who is just a grizzly veteran who knows a few things. So uh, I only want to work two days a week, though, just so you know, because uh, uh, I put my time in uh, already. Um, but uh, um, 
I think we've we've hit everything here. In, in terms of uh, parting shots, I will, I will just say that, uh, Micah, even though everybody's consumed with fast and, and quick and getting it done, um, and, and there's less emphasis on quality, um, there's still space in media for people like you who want to do it the right way. And for people like you who are who want to tell good stories and for people like you who don't, who just don't want to, um, you know, be in a, an, in a space where other people are just doing ordinary work. Um, there's still an opportunity for greatness. And I, I, and I say that as somebody who truly challenges themselves to do their best work, um, uh, you know, channeling my inner Allen Iverson to really make the last piece that I do the best piece that I've done. Um, I have, I haven't gotten there yet. I have some pieces that I'm proud of, but, um, you know, I need, I need crates of work. Um, and burying myself now when it's all said and done, uh, I need people to look at the volume of my work and not just to find three pieces that they're proud of. I, I need, I need volume. And I am not there yet, not nearly there yet. I got two young boys who challenge me um, every day to be great and to get better jokes and stop giving them dad jokes uh, and to stay fit and to stay healthy and all those things. So we have so many reasons to challenge ourselves. Um, but in, in, in the, the field of work that, we, uh, that we've all chosen here, um, I think... Uh, there's a massive letdown in that. I think most people are just accustomed with um, likes and clicks and shares. And so the work itself um, has taken a hit. So there's an opportunity there for you guys to do good work. It's always there because most people, I would argue, most people aren't doing great work. Outstanding. Mark, I can't thank you for uh, enough for um, always being willing to answer the phone on my end. So trust me when I say that, and I call you more. So I, 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 I'm, I'm not afraid to, to, to admit that. But thank you very much for your time. Uh, students, staffers, coaches, thank you for joining. And um, we'll do it again next time. Mark, thank you very much once again, and we'll be in touch, okay? Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Stay safe, all right? Thank you.